There are three other questions that I want to ask you going back to hormones post-menopause. Um, and these are, I'm saving the three most contentious questions for, for last on this topic. Question one, I buy your argument. This is someone's posing this question to you, not me. I buy your argument that hormones are safe. But I am now 56 years old. I finished menopause at 49. Isn't it too late to do anything about it? Yeah. So we have this idea in menopause medicine called the timing hypothesis. Or the window idea, right? So the question of the timing hypothesis is what are you afraid of? What are we worried about? We're mm -hmm. worried about blood clots. We're, we don't want to hurt people. We're worried about cancer. We're worried about blood, blood, blood clots. We're worried about heart disease. But the question is, is does the hormone therapy that we use apply to the data that we have? And I would argue it doesn't. And so there is a level of we don't know what we don't know. Um, but even the timing hypothesis using PremPro, which was the medicine used in the WHI, is under question. So Susan, Susan Davis from Australia just wrote a big paper questioning the timing hypothesis and say, actually, when you look at the data really closely, even it doesn't really hold muster. We shouldn't really be forcing people to like say you cannot start hormone therapy after 60. So I think this is where shared decision making really comes into play of what are we treating? What are we trying? Do you care about your bones? Do you care about your sexual health? Do you care about, you know, sort of your mental health? And do you want to see if hormone therapy helps with these things? Now, hormone therapy is indicated for three reasons. Vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, that sort of thing. Prevention of osteoporosis, which to me is a green light. So anyone should be offered hormone therapy right. because who wouldn't want to prevent osteoporosis? And the thing I just talked about a lot is the genito and urinary syndrome of menopause. So anybody of any age, and I'm talking even perimenopause and premenopause, vaginal estrogen or DHEA is safe and really helpful to prevent UTIs and should be used absolutely everywhere. Throughout life. Throughout life. Um, okay. Now I'm going to ask another uh, question that is the extension of that question, but I think your logic is going to hold the same, which is the hedging strategy, which says not only use as little as possible for as short a duration as possible, says you really need to stop this after 10 years, right? I mean, so even if you were lucky enough to catch a woman through perimenopause and, you know, you got her on hormones by the age of 49, now that she's 69, you got to stop it, right? Definitely not. So that's really the, the, there is no data to suggest stopping it. In fact, stopping it, all of your bone gains that's go right. away. They all go away quickly. By the way, that was the argument put forth to me with one of the authors of the WHI, who is by far the most willing to concede that mistakes were made, right? Which was, okay, yes, I will concede that the estradiol is doing amazing things for the woman's bones. But remember, they're going to go away when you stop the hormones as though that was a necessary thing to do. So keep them on, right? Yeah. The, and again, this idea of if hormones, if, you, if it's not broke, don't fix it. By taking a woman off of hormone therapy, you actually potentially could be disrupting any plaques that are there. You could be causing vasospasm. Like there are all these things that could happen. And so it, we really don't want to take women off their hormone therapy unless there is a reason to. And the only reason I honestly see is if a woman has an active cancer that you are going to target hormones as a target for your treatment of cancer. That's not to say the hormones cause the cancer, but we have a target sometimes because all body parts have hormone receptors and we have used hormones as a target for our breast cancer therapies and some other cancer therapies. Is that helpful? Does that, does that make sense? Yes. And it actually dovetails perfectly into my third critical situation, which is how do we manage hormones in women who are at risk of breast cancer from a familial standpoint, who uh, have been diagnosed with DCIS, which is not cancer, but increases the risk of cancer. So that's kind of a subset of the first group. And then in women who actually have breast cancer or have a history of treated breast cancer. So I would imagine you see women that fit into all three or four of those buckets. How do you handle it? Yeah. So first, we take a long time at my clinic and we get to know each other and we really try to dive into the data and say, what do we know? What do we not know? And I always tell people, you can't take hormone therapy because Rachel Rubin tells you to take hormone therapy. You have to do your own research, figure out what you, you know, what you're interested. And so I have 
have a lot of colleagues who are, who are talking about this. You had Avram Blooming uh, on your show, and he has a great book called Estrogen Matters. He's an oncologist who's questioning a lot of this research. We have amazing colleagues of mine like Corinne Men, who is a gynecologist who had breast cancer uh, as a young person in her 20s and mm. now takes hormone therapy and talks a lot about hormone therapy and teaches courses on hormone therapy and breast cancer. So I am always learning about, well, what data? So I don't like fear. I don't like telling women they can't do things with their body. I like understanding, well, what are we afraid of? And so when it comes to the BRCA patients, if you do surgical menopause on someone and they don't have cancer and you do not give them back hormone therapy, you are trading one problem for another. You may give them extra life from a breast cancer perspective, but you are shortening their life from a bone health and a cardiovascular disease perspective. That is very clear. So the other problem is the DCIS. If you are not going to give someone endocrine therapy of any kind and they're done, they have surgery, they're done, there is no reason why they can't take hormone therapy. And then when it comes to active breast cancer, there is a lot of emerging questioning in this patient population. And again, the question is, if you're allowed to get pregnant, are you allowed to take hormone therapy? And that's really the pushback that we give some people. And I think there's a lot of data that we need here, but we need to be asking these questions. I'm a urologist. To stop, when I came out of my training, it was testosterone fuels prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, 10 years later, it's, you have prostate cancer? Sure, we can give you testosterone, no problem. If you have metastatic disease, we target testosterone, so we're going to use castration level androgen blockers. But that doesn't mean if you have localized disease that you can't have testosterone therapy. So we think of testosterone and prostate cancer as a saturation model concept. And I actually think we need to be using that model potentially when it comes to breast cancer and have more logic and understanding and less fear. Um, it's marketing. All prostate cancer is testosterone sensitive prostate cancer, but we don't cut off testicles for the fear that a, a, an abnormal cell will happen in a prostate. All A lot of breast cancer is estrogen uh, 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 receptive breast cancer. Not all of it, right? But some of it is. That doesn't mean that estrogen causes cancer. Is that helpful? Like, I think it's a... It's uh, insanely helpful. And of course, it echoes exactly what Ted Schaefer said when we spoke about this after discussing the Traverse trial, which was, I think to me, the most telling thing that Ted said was, look, if I have a man who's got a Gleason 3 plus 3, means he has prostate cancer and we are going to follow this, and if it becomes a 3 plus 4, he's, we're going to actually have to take this thing out. Um, we'd put him on TRT if he needed it. And his argument was exactly your argument on the pregnancy side, which is the reason we would happily give him TRT is Let's just assume he's a man replete with testosterone. Would we castrate him Correct. during that period of time of observation? Of course not. So why would I not give him testosterone if he needs it, even though he actually has prostate cancer? And this is, again, where that patriarchal divide happens is we're willing to take those risks and focus on quality of life when it comes to men's health. We castrate women with the mere thought that they may develop an abnormal cell in their body and completely ignore their quality of life. and all of those things that go with it. And that women are more than breast tissue. They are so much more than their cancer risk. And we have to understand and actually have these reasonable conversations with women. And what I say is your oncologist is not in charge of you. They don't tell you, they give you advice. They are, so the, it's like a pit crew. Let's go back to our car model. Hmm. You have a pit crew, but you get to decide who's on your pit crew and who fits into your pit crew. But it can't be just one doctor. You may need someone to talk about your sexual health. You you may need someone to talk about your menopause hormones. You may need a bone doctor. You may need a, you know, a heart doctor. So you need to collect your pit crew. But with one doctor says, no, you can't do this with your body. I don't like that terminal. I don't think it's fair anymore. And when you give women information about how their bodies work, they make great decisions for themselves. They can look at the menu and say, listen, I'm most worried about Alzheimer's and I've looked at the data and this is what I choose to do. Or, hey, I'm more worried about uh, osteoporosis. Listen, my grandma died. No, sorry, my grandma broke a bunch of ribs, right? She had Alzheimer's and osteoporosis. And my grandpa hugged her and she broke a bunch of ribs. Like, that's not how I want to age, right? So what do I care about? I don't want to get osteoporosis. I don't want to get dementia. And I've seen all the literature. Hormone therapy sounds pretty good to me, right? Like, and, and that's really the key. I think there's a lot of people on social media maybe negative about hormone therapy. But if you look, they are on hormone therapy themselves. They will say they have an estrogen patch on. Wait, I'm sorry, I don't. I, because I don't pay any attention to social media, <laughs> there are people out there saying, 
they're they're anti HRT, but they use, use HRT. So I don't. Know, what's their argument? What are they talking about? This idea that we are overselling HRT, that not every woman needs HRT, and I'm not suggesting every woman needs HRT, but I want every woman to be offered the menu, right? I want them to know what they are. Like, like, uh, just like I want people to know how to exercise and lift weights and eat healthy. Here's the menu. If you choose to smoke and drink and do drugs, that is your choice. But I want you to know that the menu exists. Does that make sense? I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.